thank you APJ Kolkata Literary Festival for inviting me here to be in this literary festival and of course for the opportunity to meet Christopher, Tonika and Shravani. Uh, we are going to make it a free-flowing conversation this afternoon so that everyone feels a little energized including actually mostly myself because this is after lunch for everyone and we just need to participate. I thought maybe we could start with questions from the audience you know, if you want to make it different, but then, okay, uh, uh, let that be for the moment. And I'd like to start asking first uh, Christopher, because he's on the father's side, so he should come in first. And this is his extraordinary book on uh, the three cartographers from Germany, the Schleng Schlengenwitz brothers, uh, sorry, it's a difficult pronunciation uh, and difficult spelling, you know, and, uh, and about their uh, exploration in India and their having taken on a translator who's a local boy from Mumbai. And the entire book is seen from the eyes of this local Bengali, uh, sorry, Mumbai orphan boy who lives in an orphanage, but he's pulled out, somehow actually kicked out to be with the three cartographers. So, uh, and he's uh, all set to write uh, or make the museum of the world. So this is what this book is about, with a lot of humor and with a very different way of looking at the world. So, uh, uh, Christopher, first of all, uh, this Bartholomew, this... Uh, yeah, these three cartographers certainly did exist, right? How did you chance upon them? Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for being here. I'm very happy um, because um, they're, they're a very important part of the book actually is situated in, in Calcutta. And, um, and I think if I hadn't visited Calcutta a few years back, I probably would have not started working on it. So I know I'm even happier that I get to present it and, you know, I've, I've written it in German, so I'm even happier that it was translated into English and it was it's such a beautiful translation. So, um, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, you don't hope for too much as a writer sometimes, but like this is kind of a dream come true for me. So I'm very happy to be here. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so I, I came across this story a few years back already and I, I, I always thought there's something interesting about it. I mean, it almost sounds like some, like, how they call it, like, elevator pitch, where it's like these three Bavarian brothers um, uh, funded by the East India Company and supported by, like, Salana for Humboldt go for three years all over South uh, Asia and High Asia, and uh, only two of them return to Germany. Ha. And then, you, you know, you already written, like, read the blurb, by, basically. And I always found it interesting, a good story to tell, on top of that, mid-19th century, you know, like in th one of the years is the 1957 they're traveling in, so lots of things happening, great background, everything. But um, the main issue I had with it was um, how, how to tell the story, because, um, you know, like all of you know that like in the 19th century already, there have been so much writing from some, you know, white guys from the West who writing about some stories in, in India, and I was like, um, uh, okay, I'm not, I, I, it can't just be like me, the Bavarian, writing about the Bavarians and seeing at, uh, looking at South Asia and seeing like, oh, it's also very exotic and strange and, and it's also like looking at it through the magnifying flying glass and saying like, oh, very interesting. Um, and so I've, I felt like I have to figure out a new way of telling that, that story. And that's when I came across Bartholomew, who um, basically is the character who turns the whole thing around. Um, I mean, he even though he's 12 years old, he considers himself a scientist. And he um, basically says, like, you know, these people, they, all, they come here and they tell us, you know, what our names are and how this mountain is called and how things work and they analyze us. And um, so I'm, I'm just going to do the same to them. And that's why he starts um, writing this kind of museum where he objectifies, uh, turns everything into an object. And mostly it's those Schlackenwald brothers, like the, the Western people who come there. And so it's like he ha he's... He's analyzing them and he's looking at them and he also renaming some of the people because he's like, this is a more fitting name to them. And so he, he does to them what they're doing, uh, what they have been doing to him and his people. So uh, Christopher, thanks. It's uh, probably accessible to find out more about the three Bavarian cartographers. So you go to archives and you go to libraries and you get to know about them. How did you uh, 
to you know get to know more get to know more about the orphanage and a person like Bartholomew, did he actually exist? By the way, is it a true uh, character, or it's uh, and how, what what took you to that? Because I'm asking you particularly because I work in a children's home. We have six yeah. children's homes, so <laughs> I found a lot of that very interesting. Okay. So, what made you look at it from the eyes of a boy like Bartholomew? Well, well, first of all, uh, Bathroomy didn't exist. It's not like there's this one translator who was able to speak to 10 languages and who traveled with them. He's a more of a culmination of characters, particularly like translators, because they had translators with them, but obviously not just one or two. I mean, very often in certain regions where they were traveling, they had like three, four translators who were translating. So they, you know, they weren't even able to speak Hindi, so they would... Some, someone translate sometimes their German into English and then their English was translated into Hindi and the next translator would translate from Hindi into the more local language and then all the way back. So, but he is of course representing them. And that, that's the one thing, but it's more like, like a technical issue. Um, what I found more um, interesting and at some point why he grew so much on me was that I wanted to have someone you know, who has the audacity to look at things the way he does and that's why I needed a, a, quite a young um, narrator, you know, like I, I, I felt like he has this. Children often, on, children narrators, they have this great advantage that they, on one hand, they can be very wise because they see things for what they are, and they also will say that this way. I mean, I, I'm making that experiences, those experiences right now. My daughter's five years old, and she'll say a lot of things. You know, like you're driving in the car, and then she she's, she'll say like, "This is not a very good driver." Like, uh, but she says it so loud, she says it's like to the driver. She's like, you're not a very good driver because you're so fast or something. You know, it's like, so they will, they will say those things. But at the same time, of course, there's a great deal of naivete. So there's, you know, they can say something wise, but then also not. So that, that makes it very appealing as a narrator. Um, but on top of that, um, if you have a child, um, it's kind of like, you know, I guess in a Shakespearean sense, it's, uh, you have this court, court jester. Whereas like you, you get away with saying and doing a lot of things and yes, there might be punishment, but you still kind of, it's accepted because anyway, you're just a kid. You can just be here. We'll meet this very important person. You can be here. Just be in the background. Just be silent. As if you had been like a 25-year-old man, probably not acceptable. But in this case, I it was. Um, and then at some point, you know, there's this element that I also as a writer can't really control. It's just that um, Bartholomew um, kind of, grew also in the story and grew into the, the story. That's like, I didn't, I don't, I still don't have the feeling that I made most of these choices so consciously about him, but at some point I just, like, I personally believe that he existed. I mean, there's no, I can't prove it to you, but I have the really this feeling that, that he was there and that he's, he's kind of the, the voice for a lot of people in that time. And, and that's, I think, the last element that, you know, these travels, people always focused, of course, on, you know, these, guys who came and who were the heads of these ex ex expeditions, but, um, you know, they had a hard, tough time. Sure, I mean, I wouldn't want to have wanted to, you know, uh, like, uh, climb the mountains in, in that time, like, no, no equipment, just hacking hundreds of steps of ice into the mountains, but at the same time, like, most people who were along, gone, came along with them, they had an even harder time. I mean, they were sleeping under the sky. Most of these guys, they didn't sleep. They, they, they slept in a building. If there was anything like a cottage nearby, they would sleep there. And if they went to Calcutta or Bombay, they, of course, were invited to all the parties and they were high commissioner guests and stuff. So um, I felt like it's also much more interesting to look at these other people because, you, yeah, sure, they did an adventure, but these other people, they did actually the great weight. They carried the weight. And sometimes literally, I mean, like with Palki and so on. <laughs> I'll come back to you again about some of the characters in the book, the other people and also uh, the people. So, uh, but I'll go to Tanika uh, for a very obvious question, Tanika, uh, about Dinesh Gupta, because you are uh, a dis uh, related to Dinesh Gupta, and he's uh, like an eternal hero for everybody in Calcutta. Absolutely eternal, eternal hero. I mean, all the minibuses have his name. You know, so you see him everywhere, uh, uh, his name's plastered. And, but uh, uh, along with the obvious question about your work and your uh, thoughts and what you think about Dinesh Gupta and how it has impacted or uh, been seen in Indian history and how you see it. Uh, and of course, beyond that, I'll also ask you questions about your 
your new play on Young Gandhi and about your earlier play on Abdul and uh, Victoria, if you would like to talk about it, because Shabuni has also written a book on Abdul uh, and Victoria, which has been made into a film and which, uh, you know, is uh, been much uh, admired and much awarded. So, over to you, Tanika. Well, I have to start by saying my play isn't actually about Victoria and Abdul, but yeah. with their characters in the play. Yeah. So, uh, Dinesh Gupta is a, my dadu's uh, younger brother, so my grandfather's younger brother. And from a very early age, he was uh, talked about in the family, you know, as a martyr. And when I first started writing, uh, I started reading through all the letters that um, the family had that he'd written from jail. So he'd written something like 91 letters, and my grandfather had them Who all. did he write these letters so to? So he wrote the letters to his brothers. He had three brothers, or four brothers, and his sisters. So the ones that were written to his, uh, the women in the family were in Bengali, and the ones written to his brothers were all written in English for some reason. But they are the most beautiful letters, and you can't help but be very admiring of him. And he, because the letters were censored, he couldn't write anything political, so... They're all about the monsoon and how many mangoes he did, he's eaten that day and who his cellmate is. But then, of course, as I got older and I read the letters, I realized there was a lot of subtext underneath what he was writing. And, you know, you have to mature to understand what the, what the subtext is. And he's talking about revolution and he's talking about the state of Bengal, Bengal and, and he, he rants and rails against, um, against marriage and the effeminization of men and how women need to, to fight as well, et cetera, et cetera. So I got very fascinated with the letters and then um, eventually when I started to write, I decided I wanted to write a play about it. Uh, and it actually took me 25 years to get the play on the stage. So in the meantime, I'd written loads of other plays that were on the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre, the Royal Court, but nobody wanted to touch this play and I thought what the hell is wrong with this play it's, it's just as good as all the others and I realized that the, at the heart of it was an Indian man who shot and killed an, in, an English uh, prison guard or you know, inspector of general prisons and it was just too uncomfortable for them so after 25 years I finally got the play on at the Globe Theatre in, um, in London and it felt very momentous because you know, the Globe Theatre faces out onto the Thames, and on the other side of the Thames is the St. Paul's Cathedral. And you couldn't help, but when you heard the words Bande Mataram being shouted in the Globe, you kind of couldn't help but think, oh yeah, I think he'd like this. But the way, <laughs> the way that I wrote it was very much looking at all the politicians during the time, so Netaji's in there, Gandhi's in there, and um, uh, also Nehru. Uh, I used the letters, I, and, and then of course I made stuff up, because that's what I do as a, as a writer. So I just made the story work, but it was all based on um, loads of research. I became like an academic, sitting in the library for ages, looking up stuff that I had no idea. I didn't know that the Bengal volunteers took a, a, a vow of celibacy. I didn't know that they were... Um, like the IRA. And in fact, in many ways, when I first started looking up, I looked up Dinesh Gupta, freedom fighter, and I couldn't find anything about him anywhere. And then I said to my father, I can't find anything about Dinesh Gupta. And he said, go back to the British Library and look, uh, look him up under terrorist. <laughs> so I did that, and there he was, <laughs> under terrorist. And of course, for me, that was quite amusing because I you know, in our family, he was a saint. So it was very nice to ha finally get the play on and to have it in front of a British audience and also to see many, many Bengalis in the audience who were all weeping. And also, finally, it got, uh, I got a big award from Edinburgh University for it. So that was, that was lovely. So uh, why did it take you so long? Was it because you were too close to it and you wanted to be really accurate and you know really or were you too emotionally involved with it to be yeah I think as I get older I realized I probably was too close to it and I was very worried about um, writing something that wasn't respectful of his memory 
But of course, as you get older and uh, more experienced as a writer, you realize you have to throw all that away. Mm. You have to throw the research away. You have to throw your own uh, hang-ups away. And I th so I think I got better as a writer, definitely. But I also think there was something about the subject that was, well, is obviously very uncomfortable for the British uh, theatre industry. I mean, the Br British theatre is a very, very closed shop. It is the most <laughs> guarded, gated community you could imagine. And it's only recently really been opening up. I mean, when I first started writing nearly 30 years ago, they would say, we don't have any Asian actors in this country. Do you mind if we have English people putting on Indian accents? That was 30 years ago. So, I mean, obviously that wasn't going to happen. But that's what I mean, that it took a long time to get these plays on. Uh, and it takes a long time to develop a play, like a novel, like any research. It's not that you just write it and then it's on. It takes years. Sometimes it takes 25 years. Yeah. And you have broke the gate, of course, to be in the globe. Wow. With this play. Uh, just, I'm just curious to, you know, and that's why I ask you this question. What sort of audiences did you have in the globe to watch the play? Well, I mean, London is a very multicultural um, society, so we've got a very wide and varied audience. Uh, w w when I said that, it was really nice to see a Bengali audience, because Bengalis are very, very difficult to get into the, you know, they never come on time, they're always late, they're too busy eating, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm being, I'm being facetious. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, the point is that people won't come and see theatre if there's nothing for them. So... So the get, I call them the gatekeepers of British theatre. They always say, yeah, but we don't really get many Asian audiences. And I say, well, if you keep putting on, you know, the same old Harold Pinter, the same old David Edgar, the same David Hare, then no, they're not going to come. But if you put on plays that reflect us in some way... And then, of course, there's the other thing, which is that we are much more mixed now. So although we had Bengalis there, we also had... Bengali Jamai next to him who was English and you also had you know a very mixed audience of young people who were you know who are much more multicultural than our generation were so I think that actually the British audience for me at the globe was a very wonderful kaleidoscope it's not just one culture but the, my point is unless you put the plays on that reflect that culture then they're, they're not going to come and it be it remains elitist also, Ultimately. you had the top, you had a cast which is brilliant, top actors. Yeah, top, yeah, we yeah. work very hard on on ma making sure we find the right actors, and that's the great thing about being a playwright is that we are all powerful. It's not like being a writer of film, in 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 UK or in, and and certainly not in Germany either. In the UK, if you are a playwright, everybody's working to make your play work. They're trying to breathe life into your play. The actors are trying to breathe life into you. Nobody can change a single word of your play without your, without your say so. Otherwise, all hell breaks loose. And we work constant. It is collaborative, so we do work constantly with the actors. Uh, you know, they often go, Tanika, I can say this, this huge long speech you've written with a look. And you go, yeah, you probably can actually cut that. So, so it is collaborative. It's not that, you know, I sit there like a queen. But certainly it's... Um, you know, we, we work with the director to get the actors, we work with the designer, we work with the stage man. So it's a very happy family. It can be, sometimes it's not, but usually it is. Do you have one of the letters with you? Yes. Where, you where you can read yeah, from? The, it's so, so I've got one of the letters that inspired me. This is where I get my glasses out. My son managed to screenshot it for me. So I'm going to read it out to you. So this is, sorry, let me just find it. It's here. This is, uh, this is a letter that Dinesh wrote from jail, Alipur Central Jail, on the 27th of June, 1931. And it's got the Alipur Jail uh, you know, letter heading on it. And it's written to, um, sorry, I just pressed the wrong button here. It's written to uh, his Chota Dada, which was my grandfather. It says, my dear Chota Dada, received your sweet note this afternoon. I am not grieved in the least to die. I do agree that life is sweet, but sometimes death is sweeter. Do you not think so? 
I want to sleep, deep sleep, sleep that soothes the heart from the endless miseries and misfortunes of this world. Death is my friend, my greatest benefactor. Death will release me from this bondage. Death will make me free. My liberty is in death, my life eternal in death. When I die, I want no tears. If anyone loves me and is really sorry for me, let him not cry out loud. My soul shall not be satisfied with tears, with the water of helpless beings. Perhaps this is my last letter. My pronoun and best love to you. Affectionately, Nashu. Nashu was his, Nashu was his nickname. That's it's a such a beautiful sad letter. letter. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just before he was. Yeah, yeah. Pashi yeah. <laughs> So yeah. it's yeah. it's it, but it's that sort of thing that I read when I was a young British girl growing up in London that I read and I thought, wow, he was only 19. God knows what I was doing at the age of 19. You know, it's extraordinary. Yeah. I'll come back to your other works. I'll, uh, Shabuni. It's uh, an absolutely extraordinarily, overwhelmingly well-researched book, The Mystery of the Parsi uh, Lawyer. Uh, and it's again another landmark that you are creating after your uh, book on Abdul and Victoria and the spy princes and now this one. Uh, so the, the amount of research that this book contains and the way you've made it so readable and so accessible, but the huge amount of research. You know, how did you go about this? I mean, you traveled to the place where his father lived. You, you know, went and looked at where he came from in Bombay. Then you went and, you know, all the way where he was buried. I mean, it was, it's just extraordinary. So just tell me about all the research that you did to get this book going and how long did it take you? Thanks, Sujata. Um, just before that, I just want to say thanks, Tonika, for reading that. That was beautiful. And um, I did attend. I was one of those Bengalis at that play there at the Sam Wanamaker uh, studio. It was beautiful. So thank you for that. And um, I wrote about it in Ananda Bajar here, so um, some people might have read it. But yeah, back to the Parsi lawyer. Well, it was intriguing because um, I knew that, um, well, I'm a fan of Sherlock Holmes' books and Arthur Conan Doyle. And I knew that um, the only case that Arthur Conan Doyle ever investigated uh, was to do with an Indian. <laughs> I mean, for me, it was a no-brainer. Sorry, it was a no-brainer. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. So I'll, I'll just start, repeat it. So I knew that Arthur Conan Doyle, um, you know, who invented Sherlock Holmes, um, the only case that he ever investigated personally, wearing the hat of Sherlock Holmes, uh, was to do with an Indian. It was to do with a young Parsi lawyer. So for me, the sort of books I write, you know, I love digging out these unknown stories. And it was a no-brainer. I had to do it. But it took a while. I mean, I was busy with other projects, etc. And uh, it was only in 2015 that I saw this little um, report in the Times in London. And it said some letters of Arthur Conan Doyle were going to be auctioned at Bonhams. And these letters, they said, were to do with um, the George Edalji case. They were letters which the policeman the, and exchanged with Arthur Conan Doyle. So for me, that was like, OK, you've got to do this. I had actually just finished writing Fucking in Another Country, which was about the First World War. And I was, uh, you know, wanted something different. And this was just waiting for me to start. So I started following up. I read. First of all, I prayed, which I don't do, that for God's sake at this auction, let it not go into private hands, you know, let it be accessible. And uh, it was, they were bought by, the papers were bought by Portsmouth Library. Um, so that was a good starting point. I went there, read these boxes and boxes they had, and they just, they were, these were the police reports. So, you know, nobody had seen these, not even Arthur Conan Doyle, while he's investigating this. and. It just brought out everything that was happening. You know, the police chief, I'll keep it short, but it just revealed to me that the police chief is, um, is absolutely out to trip up Arthur Conan Doyle. He will go to extreme measures. And nobody knew this, not even, you know, as I said, not even the man who's investigating this case. But do you want me to just say what the case is before? Yes, yes. yes I wanted you to <laughs> yes. summarize because yes, I sorry. simply yeah. can't yeah. attempt to do that. Yeah, yeah. no, so yeah. the, who is George Adalji? He is a lawyer, 
a 28-year-old lawyer who lives near Birmingham in a small mining village in Staffordshire called Great Worley. And George's father, uh, Shapurji Adalji, is the vicar of Great Worley. And he had come from Bombay, that was his journey. Now, this is 1876. Here is a man, and we read from the newspaper reports, he has a very Indian accent, he's a brown man, he's gone to a small village in England, entirely white parish, and he's going to preach the word of God to them. I mean, it was, it was a formula, you know, a recipe for disaster straight away. So he had an English wife, he had three children, George is the eldest, and straight away, this is, you know, Queen Victoria is in power, this is the empire at its height. He, they start receiving anonymous letters, racist comments, everything that you can imagine happens. But all that happens, George grows up. We come to the next century, 1903, things happen in this village, gruesome things. Um, and somebody's out, there's a killer out, and he is mutilating animals. He is slashing horses, and he's leaving them to die in the fields, slashing cattle. And nobody, the police are clueless. He comes in the dead of night, slashes it, slashes the cattle, goes away. And um, it's the village of fear. The newspapers are picking up the story. It's the village of fear. They start calling him the Whirly Ripper. And of course, it's breeding all this uncertainty, you know, what's happening, the gossip, the speculation. Who is this local man killing animals? It's a gruesome crime. And of course, what happens? Who do you suspect? There's this one odd family in the village and letters start circulating that it's George. It's got to be the one brown man. This peculiar vicar, uh, this man, brown man, his two children, his English wife, who they frown on because she's married uh, an Indian. She's let down the side, etc. Anyway, so they suspect George Dalji. The police are also biased. George is arrested, he's in prison, the jury decide, you know, in four days. No evidence at all that he's the one, he's done it, lock him up. Penal servitude for seven years is the harsh sentence. He goes to jail. Is my mic speaking? Yeah. Um, so he goes to jail. Should I just do something special? Yeah. He's in jail, and then there is a campaign, and he's released in three years. And... Uh, he then is, has been struck off the solicitor's rolls. He doesn't know what to do with himself. He has no earnings. And he decides, he picks up the pen, and he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle. He's been reading the Sherlock Holmes books in jail. Hound of Baskerville has just been released. And he says, the only man who can solve this is this man. And uh, Arthur Conan Doyle says yes. So he takes on this case. And well. This investigation starts, he goes to the spot, he is, he is wearing his home's hat, he has to, he interviews the locals, he goes to the spot of the crime, and Sujata, I follow him. So I am, I am then doing what he did, I uncover how Doyle, uh, you know, discovers this thing. So then I go into the files, and I also see, thanks to these records in the archives, what the police are doing, and the police are trying to put him off. <laughs> I mean, I won't reveal the details. You have to buy the book to do that. But my goodness, they trip him up. There is corruption at the highest level and uh, everything to keep him, you know, so that he can't solve the case. But anyway, that's the story. That's the investigation that happens. <laughs> You've also made it a kind of a personal story about Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm -hmm. And you suggest that you, he took up this case not just because he thought this was an important case of racial prejudice, but also because he was struggling in his own life. Mm -hmm. Yep, so th at the time that he gets this letter, actually, is this letter drops through, this plea from George, is a time when um, Arthur Conan Doyle is passing through a difficult time in his personal life. His wife had just died, so he's in mourning. She's died a few months ago, but there's also a feeling of guilt. Because while he was looking after his wife, uh, who was suffering from tuberculosis, uh, he had fallen in love with a young woman. And now he was free to marry her. So he had this feeling of guilt that, you know, did I wish that, you know, my, my wife would die? And he's tortured. So, you know, all of you, have, you know, most of you have read the Sherlock Holmes books. They open with 
uh, Sherlock Holmes in this mood, you know, he's depressed, he's upset. And I think that was the mood Arthur Conan Doyle was in when he receives this letter and then this case comes. And he says in his memoirs that it was a welcome distraction. So he took that. And then what better for this most famous author to fight than a miscarriage of justice? He saw it as a miscarriage of justice. And it got him a lot of, um, you know, all his fellow authors, they all, George Bernard Shaw, uh, all of them came, you know, they, they said, you know, good for you, standing up to this, fighting for this cause. He went hammer and tongs at the Home Office. And he also compared it. Um, he said it was very much like uh, the case in France. Uh, and he said, so this was his moment, you know, which Emile Zola, the Dreyfus affair, I won't go into it, but that was a case of, uh, you know, just a, a Jew being accused of selling military secrets. And he said the Dreyfus affair happened in France, and we looked down on it, but this is the equivalent of the Dreyfus affair. That happened to a Jew, this is happening to a Parsi, and, uh, you know, it was his Emile Zola moment. He wrote in the Telegraph, and he really wanted it to be, you know, just out there campaigning, which he did. What, what, year, what year was this? This is in 1907. And then he is, um, well, it goes all over the world. Suddenly, George Adalji, this 28-year-old Birmingham solicitor, who actually led a really boring life. He would go to work, he'd come back, <laughs> he'd take the same train every day, He'd go on lonely walks. He didn't have too many friends. He didn't drink. He hadn't, you know, he wasn't at the pub or anything. Suddenly, oh, it's all over. The, the articles are reproduced in the New York Times, Washington Post, all over England. And he's become the hero of the moment with Arthur Gordon Doyle's support. So. But the mystery was never really solved. You can't give away anything, Sujata. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, sorry. no, it is. No, I'm not he's... actually giving the conclusion. <laughs> no. I'm just saying the process that you've described is so important in this book. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> it's, it's all about the process and what happened, the kind of letters that you found yeah, that yeah, the police were writing and the people were talking <laughs> about their comments. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to bring you back and all three of you back mm -hmm. to uh, this, you know, you suggest that mm -hmm. racism uh, still exists in current inquiries made by the British government. Uh, there is very much a conclusion, conclusive evidence and conclusions mm -hmm. that racism exists even today. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll come back to you about that mm -hmm. and why you say that and what you feel about it. But let me just go to Christopher about it because you know, you seem to look at the three Bavarian cartographers quite skeptically. If, uh, if uh, <laughs> I'm not wrong, I mean, you're looking at them from the eyes of Bartholomew, you know, and you're trying to come back to Bartholomew and you, you know, you also seem to suggest that look at history from the eyes of the people who worked in that orphanage, you know. And uh, again, I think here there's a question about uh, the kind of comments that these uh, German cartographers are making, and uh, it's certainly about uh, you know the way they live and the way they expect the people who work for them live, so even in, when they are in a different country from their own. So, Christopher, what did you think about? I mean, did that strike you? Was that the driving uh, passion or emotion in you in writing this book? Uh, certainly a very important point um, uh, about the book and what that made me emotionally more inclined to, to write it um, because uh, it's and yeah I mean obviously all that racism still exists um, I, what I found interesting is like I mean of course nowadays we often use racism and then people are like oh but I'm not a racist like in Germany very often you, people would say you know like this is not racist to say that I'm just saying something nice so if I'm saying something nice it's not racism no so like I, 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 I think I came across this topic much more often uh, uh, after I had met my wife and after we were spending quite a bit of time in, in Berlin and you know like in Berlin in uh, Kreuzberg which is fairly left and progressive community but even so even in this community even among people who have often fairly good education you know uh, I, I had a lot of experiences um, I think that was the starting point a lot of experiences where you know you sit at the dinner table with people who all went to university and then at some point someone would turn to her and say like so you went to school in India so did you ride to school on an elephant 
but not in a sarcastic way or in an ironic way. It's like dead serious way. You know, it's like, and <laughs> sometimes I would just feel like, so what? So that, should I ju jump in and defend? This is not the right thing. But or should I just maybe I just have to go to the toilet now because it's really embarrassing. <laughs> um, and then if people, if you would, you know, if you call out people, then you would always say like, they would say like, but it's just honest curiosity. I'm just interested, you know. I'm, or, or if they say something positive, which would be, you know, that stuff like, oh, but. Your German is so good, you know. Considering you grew up in Delhi, it's like really, really good because you know. So, so all that that kind of stuff I came across quite a bit, um, and always like experience it next to her because otherwise I probably would have never, you know. I'm 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 one of these fortunate people, you know. I'm like a white cis man from Germany. I mean, I'm like you know, I can travel to most countries. I don't have problems with visa. I have like a. I'm almost like an extraterrestrial on this planet in a, in a way because like this minority. Um, and so I, um, it was very, very important for me, of course, that, that was the starting point. And then when I came across the story, I, I just felt that a lot of the things that people, and uh, I'm only speaking now about Germany because I know it better, don't get nowadays has a lot to do with that time. Because, um, like, to make a, it's a really, really big arch, but um, so basically, you know, like, this whole idea with race and so on, that, that is a, a very important story that is told in the book. Um, because I wasn't so aware of it. I always felt like, okay, it uh, always has been in this way or the other, but it actually hasn't. It hasn't been always there. Like if you look at, you know, historically, I was talking to a lot of historians, if you look at, say, like ancient Rome, for example, sure, there were classes that always existed and there was slavery and so on, but, but like racism, such as this kind of racism, biologically explaining why someone is not as good as well, that, that just didn't exist. You know, you had emperors who were black. so. That only really became really rampant in the 19th century, and, and, and it, I, I found it so interesting that you have this thing, and that's also, I think, what a lot of people, even if they don't know history so well, like subconsciously, over, like have this perception of the 19th century of this like great, this was like the great time in Germany, for example. It's like, yeah, that like we built the nice buildings, we had all the inventions, we had all these poets, and then afterwards, I don't know what happened, but somehow there were these two blips in history, and it's like somehow we had this mistake, and but now we're fine again, you know, like, and as, and I always felt like that's so strange. How can you go from there to there? in just in a few years and that's not what happened it didn't happen in a few years it was like a constant movement towards that time and for some of these brothers i mean they were very well educated scientists and for their time probably quite progressive i mean there were even there are lots of comments where they're criticizing the british how they're looking down on indians and so on so they they did see stuff of that but but still all the way, uh, all the same they were you know that they they had their ideas of like uh, you know you can't deal with these people because they, are t they tend to be criminals and so on. And uh, it's interesting what, you know, th what they did. They went, for example, in Calcutta. It's one of the most interesting stories about them. They went to Calcutta and they went into the prison here. And they took um, so-called, um, they called it racial types. So they took, like, uh, with, with plaster, they took masks of, of prisoners, of more than 200 prisoners. And they, you know, these prisoners had to keep these masks on their faces for several hours for it to dry. They had, like, these straws in their nostrils in order to be able to breathe. Um, and then afterwards, they, they painted these masks in four different kinds of colors. And then they've tried to you know, say, like, OK, this is this kind of race more, and this is that kind of race more. And that was mid-19th century. Um, and then they also measured the people. They measured their bones. You know, they, so they had to really squeeze into the skin, because you had, could only measure bones. You didn't, you didn't want to measure the, the fat and the skin. And so they did all these, this kind of thing which was considered research. And that all kind of supporting this idea that, so, okay, we have enlightenment and we come from the West and we are so well educated, but at the same time, would be quite nice, um, you know, if we could, like, exploit other parts of the world and, you know, and conquer them. But how can we do this if we believe in enlightenment and that humans are all the same, you know, and that we're all brothers? How can you combine that? And yes, there's a nice bridge. It's race uh, like racism because then you can simply say like yeah we're all the same but unfortunately since you have a darker skin you just are not able to understand the finer nuances of art and and you are not able to speak all this language and also and so on so on so on and so that is something that really grew and that you can tell in germany where that led to like 90 years later of course and that's why like that was something that was really uh, like dear to me because in germany people i guess they just go through all the layers, but so far I feel like colonialism and that whole time is not a big topic so far. Like it's not, there's hardly been talked about a bit of it. There's here and there, but generally we've been dealing, you know, GDR, then the Second World War, First World War, all, all these things that happened, and now slowly they're arriving at this conclusion that like, oh, there was something even before that, or no, there's even more 
you know. So, but that's I think where the discussion is heading towards to. So, Tanika, how would you respond to what Christopher is saying at the end? <laughs> I think it's interesting, a white man yeah. talking about racism, because I think that basically we've been suffering for British UK people, we've been suffering with it forever, and now we're suffering with it under an Asian prime minister, which is even worse, who's the biggest racist you've ever met. So, I, I mean, I, I think the racism does come from colonialism, and... The, the thing that I'm very aware of is that, I'm talking about Britain in particular, they have not engaged with what they actually did, not only in India but in Africa and all over the world. And so what's happened is that they don't teach it at school. So I think even in Germany they, they, they teach the kids about what happened in the Second World War under the Nazis. Nobody teaches anything about the British Empire in, in um, Britain. So when I went to school, I mean, I went to Oxford and I read history, but when I was at school, the history that we learnt was the Tudors and the Stuarts in the Second World War, and we never knew that there were any Indians that were fighting in the First World War, even though there were millions there. And that's why it's so important that people like Shrabhani Bashi were writing these amazing books about our history, as well, because I read your wonderful book about the First World War soldiers. And it's, it, it's shocking that even now the curriculum is very, very English, and it's actually guided by the government as well. The British government do not want any studies about empire. And I think this does trickle. I mean, they talk, always talk about the trickle-down effect. The trickle-down effect of this is that the younger population in Britain is still completely ignorant about empire. And that is where all this stuff you're talking about comes from. Uh, I, so my, my play, The Empress, that you were talking about earlier on, which is actually not about Victoria and Abdul, but has them in it, is about the British presence, sorry, the Indian presence in Britain in the 19th century. So it's about the Ayers, the Luskers, the first uh, Indian MP, the, another Parsi in 1891, I think it was. It's about young Gandhi coming over. It's about Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Again, none of this is taught in schools. So what's happened is the play, which is called The Empress, has been taken on the, the uh, national curriculum, which means that poor 16-year-olds up and down the country are now studying my play and <laughs> writing letters to me going, oh, what's this about? What's that about? I never knew about this, which is r really interesting. But why should it be only my play that's educating them? They should have these books on their curriculum. They should have plays about you know novels they've only just put tony morrison on the on the on the national curriculum beloved no, up no, until she's not then, alive anymore yeah she's not alive anymore and up until then it was all um you know uh, arthur miller shakespeare etc i mean not knocking them as writers obviously they're fantastic but so so my point is that there's a long way to go in terms of racism and the sad sad thing is that we have indian heritage politicians running Britain at the moment and all they want to do is send everyone back home as they call it and put them on a plane to Rwanda and uh, every time they come on the telly all the rest of us Asians particularly the Bengalis hold our head in shame but that, that's also what I find so interesting about colonialism that is so we often talk about colonialism and like this one way street you know that like these people colonize these people but I the more I dealt with the topic and more I felt like that it's actually happened in both ways that even the colonizers they colonize themselves it's like they don't people don't see like in, in Germany people are, I think a lot of people don't know that Germany had colonies was one of the biggest colonizers of the world they came in late in the game I, yeah sure but they had a lot of colonies but they no, don't know about it if they know about it then they're like oh well it was really short time and uh, even that don't a lot of people are not aware of and then it's like oh yeah there were a few hundred thousand people killed but that was not so much in comparison to what later happened so like people are just not aware of it at all and then they don't make the connection why they are the way people are the way they are today that because they don't see that this has something to do with themselves and just just, just as like a like a minor anecdote is i once went to a residency in germany very small place and there was nikolaus you know like the the german santa claus that is earlier than christmas and um, there were all these, these, these artists at the residency and they, they, st they still did some kind of like childish Santa Claus, Nikolaus thing there. Um, and in Germany we have this guy who's accompanying the Nikolaus and who is, he's like always black and he's black faced also. Um, and um, he's supposed to be the guy who's frightening the children, who's gonna 
put the children into the uh, sack and take them away if you didn't behave. So if you behave, you get the presents. If you don't, you're gone forever. Just a good uh, way of like educating your kids, you know. So um, and and this guy came, and then I, I saw all the artists were all like, oh, "You're doing this still with the black facing." And then they, they said like, "No, no, no, but don't don't worry, because I know over there in the Netherlands and Belgium, they had colonies, so they're not allowed to do this, you know, like the black facing." So like, but we in Germany we can do it because you know we didn't have colonies. So and and th and that's exactly. But, yeah, I mean, the two of you are common. looking at history in an entirely different way, which is very much uh, required and very necessary. And 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 Shrabuni, uh, what about your response to the response that you got <laughs> for your books oh, in the UK? Fantastic yeah. response, I have to say. Lot of um, and across the board, you know, from Indians who didn't know the story, and that's only a small part, actually. My main audience is there at literature festivals are actually all white. Um, and they really, they just come up to me. And uh, when I tell them the stories about the books I've written in the Second World War, about Nurinath Khan or the First World War, they sit there and I've seen them, you know, tears in their eyes and things. But you know, on the subject of, I grew up here. So I, you know, I'm, I didn't go to school in England. I went to school in Delhi. I went to university. And here too, I knew nothing about the involvement of Indians in the First World War and Second World War. So. Curriculums all over need to be corrected. I think here too we need to know. So that's just one point I would like to make. I think we need to be more aware. But yeah, I mean, I got a fantastic response. Lots of people. So there was nothing. I mean, a few odd ones would say, oh, this can't be true. And then they say, well, it's true. You know, it's all footnoted. Uh, but what came out, I mean, even in Victoria and Abdul, what came out was the language of these letters. You know, they were just, so they would describe these Indian servants as the Black Brigade. And it struck me that, you know, Queen Victoria actually wrote a memo saying, stop, refer you know, you cannot call these Indians as the Black Brigade. The word black will not be used. And I was like, okay, I'm quite impressed with that. And she really fought for these Indians. So that, you know, she got a few brownie points for that one there. Uh, but the establishment was so racist. I mean, they just burnt his letters. And uh, again, with the Parsi lawyer, it was the same. The language in the police files, you know, they use the N word, they use everything. It's just horrible. And you can see the racist letters that came through. But, you know, all good for George Adalji, he fought. I mean, I think that is also the immigration story. And he had a lot of support from white people, too. It's not, you know, I, you can't paint everything in one. I mean, the establishment will do something. And, there were 10,000 people who signed a petition for George Adalji, and they were white, and, you know, there were Indians who supported him. So it's a mixed bag. There's always an element, a very, always, in all minorities, there's a vocal element, and they are heard. But I think the large mass probably, you know, don't know. But there is also this thing of, um, this happened during, uh, I was writing the last bit during uh, lockdown, and Black Lives Matter has exploded. And all the reports were out, and I was just saying, what has changed? You know, this is this is still happening. The reports. So you would say that Harry and Meghan are right. Well, in a way, but I mean, they should probably stop complaining now. <laughs> We've heard it all. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, the points are there. You know, Ooh, they I don't agree. Out. I think they're bringing down the the monarchy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know See, about that. But like we've, you know, they were in Frogmore House, and Abdul Karim used to was given Frogmore House by Queen Victoria. And his letters were burned the day she died, uh, and he was sent back. And then Harry and Meghan. Forty-five Megan, seconds. Oh, I Harry think and Meghan. Told, okay, yeah. Harry and Meghan got Frogmore House, and then they had to leave. So I think nobody should go off color. Should go ever live in Frogmore House. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely cursed. cursed. It's yes. cursed. See two different views about <laughs> them, you know. Uh, so I think we've got to stop very soon. There are lots of questions yeah. in my mind, and I don't know if anyone has a question and whether we have time to take questions. But if you have a burning question, maybe we'll take it, even uh, after we are stopped. Uh, is there a question from anyone? Otherwise, I have one or two questions. And uh, since I don't see a hand going up, so Christopher, was there a father, Fuchs? What's his name? Father, was, th there was, was that a there real was the person? First, like a very small orphanage in Bombay in and the 19, mid 19, there yeah. were like two Bavarian priests uh, who, um, Jesuits, but two Bavarians, okay. yeah.
Okay, and of course, I found the uh, encounter with uh, Dalhousie very, very funny. The way you looked at uh, these Bavarian cartographers and Bartholomew, you know, really uh, what was going through his mind. But I didn't ask uh, Tanika uh, a question that was really burning in my mind about how do you approach this young Gandhi in your play? And I don't know whether we have time, but it's something that I think everybody the would The lady's standing you know. there at the microphone, yeah. Yeah. and it's just stopped. Okay. Should I not answer that? Yeah, she'll make it short, but it's okay, very Okay, no, no, I yeah. just was very fascinated with the fact that um, uh, Gandhi came over to Britain in 1888 as a teenager and basically wanted to learn to ballroom dance, learn French and play the fiddle. And he, his own account of his time there is absolutely hilarious. The whole thing about, I will not eat meat, I will not... Uh, go with other, you know, with women, and I won't drink alcohol. And I think he but tortured himself. He was dressed himself. very carefully as an Englishman. He was dressed when, in the yeah. wrong jacket, though. Yeah. He was ru he was dressed all the way uh, along in a, a white dinner jacket. Yeah. And then when he realised he had the wrong jacket, he hid in his cabin for the whole time. So I think it's very funny. It's like any. I called it the overseas student because I think he was like any uh, any other student, even today, arriving in London trying to learn stuff for the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, Tanika, Shabuni. I think this discussion would have gone on very happily and merrily for quite some time more, but we have to give space to the next panel. Thank you, uh, APJ Kolkata Literary Festival again. Thank you, all of you, and everyone who support and are the backbone on which this festival stands. Thank you so much.